Hi, everybody. My name is Tony Cliff. I am here on behalf of the Vancouver Comics Arts Festival. Uh, today, talking to Kazu Kibuishi. We're going to have a conversation. We're going to answer your questions. Um, we're going to solve comics. Um, you will know Kazu Kibuishi probably best as the author of The Amulet, series of graphic novels from Scholastic, Volume 1, most recently Volume 8. Everybody's very excited for Volume 9, as we will discuss. Um, you may also know Kazu from the Daisy Cutter comic series, which on the cover says it's from 2004. Um, and I know Kazu, and as well you may, um, as the editor of the Flight series of comics and graphic novel anthologies. Um, so that said, I'm going to pull Kazu's video on screen. <laughs> Here I, am. I, I did the right direction. Hello, Kazu. You did. Nice yeah, it works. It's magic. It is nice to see you, and it is nice yeah. to talk to you. Um, let's talk about some of these comic books that we promised to talk about. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I put out online, I wanted to hear from, from some of your amulet readers. Um, you know, what sort of questions do you have for Kazu? Uh, overwhelmingly, people would like to know when book nine is coming out. Um, can you talk a little bit about, I mean, people are very excited for book nine. Uh, do you feel any sort of pressures or that sort of thing around anticipation for this book? Um, yeah, uh, of course there's pressure. Anticipation, uh, you know, is fairly high, um, but I, um, it also, I don't know. I, I mean, it's also the final book in the series, right? It is the final book in the series. Yeah. Um, it's also in, in some sense, it's, it's, it's me just completing my first big adventure, you know, cause Amulet is technically the first graphic novel series I've worked on. Uh, even though Daisy Cutter was published as a graphic novel, it was originally a series of, of comics and flight was, it looks like a graphic novel, <laughs> but as you know, it is an anthology, which is very different than a graphic novel. Um, and so Amulet is really the first, uh, major graphic novel project that I'm going to complete. And so in some sense, it's, it's going to, you know, it feels like the end of something, but it definitely, for me, it feels like it's going to open up an opportunity to do a lot of the things I've been wanting to do, uh, for years, uh, all the things I've learned working on Amulet, I'm going to apply to what I do next. So, um, Amulet 7 and 8 were incredibly stressful to make because they were leading into the end. Number 9 is is not as stressful, but it's a lot more work because I have to put... I, all the things I've set up for myself are now having to come together um, into this one volume. But uh, it isn't as stressful because I'm not... I'm, I'm solving problems more than I'm creating them. And that doesn't stress me out as much as, uh, you know, as having to invent the problems. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know, it's, it's, it's more work and it's taking more time, uh, but it, it doesn't feel incredibly stressful. No. Um, when did the first book come out? When did the first amulet come out? It was released in January, 2008. Jan and you, and you started work on it well before then. Obviously. Yeah. Yeah. I started working on it. And it is it is 2020 as we are talking about that, which means that so this so Amulet has been you know at least a decade's worth of work. Mm -hmm. um, is it? I mean, what's it like to be to be setting a decade a decade long project to the side, um, and you know, coming to the end of this adventure and looking forward to new things? Um, yeah, it's uh, I've been working on other things all that time, so it hasn't felt like the only thing that I've done and, you know, during that time. And, and in all these years, I've also been, you know, raising a family, you know, going to schools, I've, you know, become like a public speaker, all these different things, these other avenues that, you know, that, that aren't, um, um, you know, that, that, uh, that run parallel to the, the creation of this book. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I'll probably be a lot more wistful and thinking like, what you, I don't know if you're trying to get me to <laughs> feel like I need to, to feel sad that I'm coming to the end of this thing. Um, but, um, 
No, I mean, I just like when I think of <laughs> the, when I think of the end of a long project, I mean, part of me is relieved, but yeah. then the other part is like the other part misses the like knowing exactly what I'm going to do, what I'm yeah. exactly what I'm going to work on when I wake up in the morning. Yeah, that's that's a good point. Um, however, I've known I've known about this other project since the, that I started Amulet, so it's just been on hold uh, since 1999. Because <laughs> <laughs> 1997, I think 97 is when I first worked on Amulet, and um, it was uh, it wouldn't it wouldn't be on shelves for another 11 years. You know, I signed my contract with Scholastic in 2005. Uh, and uh, the idea was that it would come out in 2006, 2007. And I ended up having to take more time to finish that first book. Uh, that first book took three times longer than I thought it would. Um, a lot more energy. I just didn't know what I was doing. That's what, that's what it came down to, figuring it out. I thought I knew, and I didn't. I didn't understand what it was like. to. You know this now. You know what it's like to make graphic novels. If you've done that. <laughs> Um, you know, to do it, to do it at the level that I think that we, we want to, you know, see graphic novels done. It was, it was a little more complicated than I initially thought. So, uh, it ended up taking quite a bit of time, you know, and, and the whole series is, is, has been a bit like that. It's, it was supposed to come out like every six months or something like that, but to think, to think that I could have possibly have done that, um, you know, at this point, I, I don't know, it would have, it would have been really unwise, I think for my health. So with a project that long, a lot, like you said, like a lot has changed in your life since you started Amulet to now, like since, since the first book come out, you, you have started a family. I mean, you have two children now. You, I, you did not have two children when, when you started this, right? <laughs> yeah. When I, I wasn't married when I started this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, the, yeah go ahead. Oh, no, no. Well, I'm just thinking like, so like a, the, spoiler alert, um, a significant event in the first book is that, is that the family's father dies. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, looking back at that now, now you have two children of your own, a boy and a girl. Um, how does that feel to you? Like what, how does that? Um, well, it, that part of the book is a little more reflective of my life. Not that my father you know, uh, died in a car accident, but that I, like this, I, I feel like the real life story is a little sadder in that our father in some sense left us. And so he hasn't been a part of our lives. Um, and that's, that's, it's, it's hard to grow up with that, <laughs> you know, uh, and talk about it actually. So I felt that it was, it would, it was better at the time when I wrote it, I decided I would write a story about a good dad who, is is no longer there uh as opposed to a, a either an, a, de a bad father who's who's going on the adventure with them <laughs> uh, or about absentee fatherhood you know and i didn't want to you know that wasn't the subject that i wanted to cover in this book um and it's why we have the first sequence in in, in amulet where he is shown to be a good father and and is, and is essentially removed from the story, um, and to, it gives agency to the kids to to to, to become the heroes as well. Um, but um, yeah, so for for me now, looking back on that, um, I don't know. It's uh, it, the story is reflective of when I made it. It's not necessarily reflective of who I am now. I, if I'm starting a new story, I'm definitely doing something else now. Um, I hope that I've been a good dad. To, you know, <laughs> my kids. I, I, that's more important to me, I think, than a lot of lot of other things. You know, including my career and stuff. I uh, I think that's does does that opening to Amulet does it read differently to you now? Um, no, not really. Um, I think it. Um, you know, I probably again, I, I wouldn't write the same story today. Yeah. Uh, if you read Amulet Eight, it's very different than Amulet One. And, and, and number nine is gonna be very different than any one of those. And then they're all reflective of a different station in life. And I think we all move from station to station. And that's often something we forget. We forget that we do change mm -hmm. over time, not like completely change of character. I'm not talking about change of character, who you are, um, 
but you you change people change their beliefs you know they they change their perspective on things they they become different people uh like in slow like new iterations of themselves over time um and uh the hardest thing to write for when i started was knowing that i would be going on this long journey and i would be a different person at the end yeah. so i was trying to write a book um that i would be proud of of having written as a as an as a mature grown older person but i was doing it while i was still young you know yeah. so i had to kind of i almost felt like i was i was sketching out my future self and i was trying to step into that role and i think that's why people thought that i was older just like i thought you were older before we met and i thought phil craven was much older before I met him and all the flight artists were all 20 something year old kids who sounded like they were 40 years old. Online. <laughs> you probably assumed that I was 40 at that time. I was I, 23. I, I, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's hard to remember back to. Um, I, thought, well, I, I seriously thought you, I was talking when I thought saw you online, I really did. I didn't think you were a peer. I thought you were one of the, <laughs> my coworkers. Who's like I, don't, I don't know. About that. <laughs> I, I, I think that you're 40 or 50 based on your taste. One one very distinct memory I have is showing up. Um, so when we were working on the flight books, mm -hmm. you would uh, you would very often sort of organize, um, and I I didn't fully appreciate what would would have been involved uh, involved in this at the time. Um, but you you would set up the a table at San Diego Comic Con and just invite everybody who was in flight to you know come hang out that sort of thing, and like one of my very distinct memories is showing up there for the first time we had we had never met we had hung out on the internet for x number of years a long time and I showed up there <laughs> and I, it was you or it was somebody else it might have been Rad um, who was like who was like oh. You talk exactly like you sound on the forums. <laughs> like that was I like that was, me. That was, it was like, <laughs> like it was like is that good? I don't know. Yeah. Um, well, Brad Seacrest, you know that, that's great that you brought him up, and he's got a TV show, right? He's got a Netflix show that looks really good, Kipo and the Wonder Beasts. That's yeah. Cool. Yeah, did you know that? Was, I think that it was started um, as like um, I think it was um, the early development for that was historian explorer. Oh, really? So it was it was one of the anthology, yeah, stories. So in a sense, I, what what he did with Kipo and the Wonder Beast is sort of what I was hoping a lot of people in flight would do is take mm -hmm. the work that they had, which is why I was so adamant that you guys kept the rights to your work that this wasn't a freelance project. Um, you know, I, Judy, our agent and, uh, and I worked as hard as we could to make sure that you, everyone kept all the, every right to it, like including the printing. The only thing that, that flight had was the printing rights in an anthology format outside of that, like it, it was free to go, you know? Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so, um, both rad and Michelle Gagne kind of took that. And, oh, and, and Don Hertzfeld of all the people. Mm. Because he and the, he 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 and Michelle went on to go and produce film versions of their flight stories. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As Michelle, especially, I think, is he trying to hand animate the entire thing himself? Yes. Okay. Um, so to rewind just a bit to recap for everybody, um, like Miyazaki, we were, talking, we were talking about flight contributor Rad Seacrest, who I yes. think um, was at the time and still is a story artist uh, down in LA. Um, who who headed up and pitched Kipo and the Wonder Beast? That's the name of it, right? Yes. Yeah. Which is currently on Netflix. Just came out uh, a few months ago. I think so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and you're also talking about Michelle Gagne. Michelle Gagne was always always had the first story in flight, right? Almost always, yeah. Which was I, I always saw that Rex. he was the vanguard of our group. You know, because <laughs> he was a, he, there was nobody nobody has more energy than Michelle Gagne. You know anybody who's met Michelle? He's not in flight one. He's in. He begins. Oh, no, you're right. Yeah. Flight two. You know he saw what we were doing. He and I asked him to to be a part of it, and uh, and he he just kept going. And um, yeah, 
Yeah, Michelle Garnier. Underworld, which is now the Saga of Rex, I believe, right? Yeah, Saga of Rex. And um, yeah, I think it's I think it's gonna be a feature. I think he's he's working on it still. Good. Yeah. Yeah. The looks amazing. Anyway, now, now it's now we're just sitting here curious. guessing what other. Yes, yeah, yeah, okay. Anyway, he's. <laughs> <laughs> and Michelle uh, lives uh, fairly close to here, out in Bellingham, Washington. Uh, he lives in Bellingham. I I, I live uh, s uh, south of him, um, towards uh, Redmond, yeah. Woodville. Yeah, and Michelle notably is a um, is just an astounding. He's like he's the uh, animation effects artist. Based, I mean, not the animation effects artist, but. Like everybody knows anyway. Oh, for, for so, Red Bird, yeah, for the Iron Giant, Ratatouille, Ratatouille. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah anyway, um, so before there was Flight, I knew you from the drawing board, Shane yeah. Martin's drawing board, where old school, and and you and you brought up like um, not knowing how old anybody was. <laughs> um, I remember my experience there being trying to. Like we, so we would we would all have been twenty something, right? Uh -huh. And the experience there for me was always just trying to post something that, you know, I could get you to comment on, or I could get Rodolph to comment on. Uh -huh. and that always felt like a big victory. Yeah. So, can you tell me? Well, or can you tell us, the audience, the invisible audience all around us? Yeah. Um, sort of how how we went from that drawing board, or how you went from that drawing board to starting up the flight project. <laughs> Yeah, uh, when we'll come we'll come back around to Amulet. I promise. Yeah. <laughs> All the kids are like, "What? What's going what? on? What are you talking to old, old men? Ooh. Old guys talking about <laughs> talking about comics, old comic bookshops, and we'll go yeah. back in time, and then we'll bring it all the way <laughs> before. What is an online forum? What is that? Um, Actually, yeah. sorry. Before before we go back, I should say for the service of our viewers and listeners right now. Um, we got a lot of questions about when Amulet Book Nine comes out. Um, Kazu's working very hard on it. Um, the best advice I can give you is to visit boltcity.com or boltcityproductions.com, where Kazu, you're currently doing a really good job of, or like a really detailed job. You're like you're bringing a lot of detail into sort of going into your inspiration for Amulet, going into the history of Amulet and how it was produced and that sort of thing. Yeah, I get a lot of emails from these kids. You guys are doing book reports, I know that. So <laughs> I'm doing you a solid, okay? Take a look at that and <laughs> and just make sure that it's not written in in my <laughs> from my perspective, okay? Yeah, just take Kazu's words. Here's again, no, you 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 you're, you're, you're taking it taking it right from my website. Anyway, but it's I want people to know about that stuff. Just how difficult it was to make something like Amulet. It's um, it is a long journey, you know. It's 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 it's, it's not it's not a sprint. It's not uh, you know it's not something that happens in a short window. It is a long 20, 30 year journey that you're going to take if you want to do something like it. And I thought that I should be transparent about it. People should know. Um, I want to demystify the the process, um, and that's part. Of, I mean, going right back to the forums. That was what the forums did, right? It demystified the process of um, being in the animation industry as a story artist. Uh, as a, you know, you saw that there were just a lot of regular f folks, like you know, people you would know, just hanging out, you know, just having fun, just drawing sketches that are fun and showing showing it to their friends, and you know, have, getting a pat on the back, and everyone's like, "Yeah, man, that's great." And, and, and it's finding some of my biggest heroes in illustration hanging out like that. Mm -hmm. It felt like I had stumbled into this magical forest <laughs> or something, you know, and I was, I can't, I couldn't believe I was chatting with some of my biggest heroes uh, and realizing you'll realize real quickly in the art world, how, how much people just, how artists just like being around each other and how much they just want to, they, they really do just want to do the stuff. That's, that's, you know, they're still the kind of the kids at heart, you know, and that's part of why they're often successful because they can, channel that in through the work uh and it's what people want to you know want to pick up when they when they buy the when you buy the films or the or the books so it, it was really great like getting to know some people like some of my 
really good friends like en Enrico Casarosa and Jake Parker on, on there. And they were a little closer to my age. And I felt like that was, and you were there as well. And as well as Phil Craven, um, I felt like we were this next generation in, in a sense mm. of storytellers and coming from the animation world, I kind of felt that there weren't enough positions uh, open for uh, story talent to take on r big roles of responsibility, you know, in the animation world. There weren't that many spots to be able to tell, freely tell a story. And it's one of the reasons why I put together Flight because I knew that they all had good individual stories, but often they were so humble that no one knew that they were, could do that. <laughs> you knew that all the artists you were meeting had. Yes, they, had, they okay. had really good stories to tell, like, you know, and, and I thought that they were oftentimes better than uh, the things we were being hired to work on. So mm -hmm. it, sometimes they weren't, you know, and there's a real good reason why they, they weren't the t like out there as an author or um, as an individual creator. Someone like Jeff Smith, who I felt went from the animation world out to, uh, to, to, to comics successfully. He navigated that very successfully. Um, and, you know, managed to, to create a, a, a quite a legacy, you know, in, 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 by doing something like that. So I, I thought, I, I saw Jeff doing that. And I thought, I saw all these other talented people in this field, just sitting around, you know, tooling around on their own, just their, their stuff like online and this drawing board. <laughs> and I thought like, gosh, it would be really great if we can get this group and, and show the world what they are capable of. Um, you know, and I didn't even think about it as a, as a business thing or something to sell, like a book to sell. It was really all about trying to get the work out there and what's the best way we can do that. If it's web comics, it could be web comics, but we were getting publishing interest. So I thought, well, why don't we take it to publishing because that would put us in the mainstream. Yeah. Yeah. Cause and comics so, is still one yeah. of those nice things. Um, like um, animation takes, unless you're Michelle Gagné, takes an entire team to make. But a you know one person, if you if you are an individual artist with a story to tell and you are also visually inclined, comics is a thing where one person can sit down, you know, at a drawing board and and make, like tell a visual story that's ready ready to be taken up. It's like it's, yeah. it feels okay. unique like that. Could add Denver, Denver Jackson up mm -hmm. there and uh, yeah. And, uh, he, he can do it all himself too. <laughs> yeah, I would not true. advise it. And Denver, I hope if you're watching this, get some, get some sleep. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so I, I, I want him to, I want him to have a long, awesome career because he's going to have, a, you know, a, a great career. His, his work is so fantastic. Uh, yeah, pace yourself. Yes. Uh, <laughs> but with, uh, with comics, um, no, I thought, I thought it was like, it was like being able to make a film in a manageable scale. Because yeah. the, 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 the risk, the amount of risk that needed to be taken could be taken by an individual. When you, when you work in a film, you know, and you've worked on number, a number of productions yourself, um, so I, I think you know what, what I'm talking about. There's an enormous amount of risk that has to be taken on for the creative vision. And when there's a lot of risk um, loaded onto the creative vision, often the creative vision will take a back seat to making sure that the risk is mitigated. <laughs> that you're creating something that you know for sure is going to, you know, return in your investment, you know? Yeah. And um, I felt like comics uh, was a, a really unique opportunity to basically make something with, with no, no need for a huge return on investment, which allowed for people to take bigger risks. So when I hear young people and some people who might be watching this right now, um, you know, overly worry about making it in comics. Mm -hmm. I think that they're on the wrong track when they're making their comics because comics are about, you You know, in, in a world like comics, it's like indie, indie music, indie anything. <laughs> and it's something smaller, you gotta take risks because that's what is afforded to you. You know, if you didn't want, if you want to make something commercial, just go work for somebody, go work somewhere. If you have talent, there's so many people who could use your talent, you know, and why, why, why take the, take risk to make something super commercial? <laughs> yeah. Mean, yeah. Commercial right? work also pays a lot better. Yeah. And then somebody might say, <laughs> like, guys are like, yeah, you know, that sells so well, it's commercial. But like when I was selling it and I started it, what I, the market did not determine what 
I should put out because there was nothing for Amulet. <laughs> there wasn't a name. There wasn't, but there weren't books like it anywhere, which is why I did it. Because I said, I said to myself, you know, these kids would really like to see something like this. And every time I pitched something like Amulet, everyone told me the kids didn't want to see it, and I thought they were wrong. I, I was, I pitched it at Nickelodeon once, and then to, you know, as a as a show, you know, they wanted me to do funny. They wanted me to do, they wanted me to do. Um, something that was a lot more SpongeBob, you know? And I wouldn't mind, but you know, I felt that doing a big fantasy adventure is something there's a lot of kids out there that a lot of kids out there would really, uh, you know, love. And I, I thought that if you looked at Miyazaki's work in Japan and its popularity, I thought it that was a perfect example of, of seeing in a, generations of, of viewers, um, you know, wanting something like, so with some seriousness to it, you know, with, with beauty and it, it has an esoteric quality to it. It's more challenging, you know, in, in a sense. And, and I thought that those, a lot of those things lasted longer than like the quick hitting funny stuff that, you know, that people seem to want. I don't have a problem with the quick hitting funny stuff, but it can't all be that, you know, yeah, yeah, you might also be selling yourself short because you do inject like a good, you do do inject uh, a good yeah. amount of humor into Amulet. Yeah, I try to make it funny. You know, I don't want I don't want people to be bored. Um, <laughs> you know, the, the books. Yeah, there's like I try to make sure there are no like dead spots in the book that are just slow, too slow. You know, if it's too slow, I'm going to be redrafting it until I can speed it up and make sure that it's really you know it has a, a very. Um, uh, like a, a good pace to read. That's my biggest thing about making Amulet is the pace. Pacing is um, number one. You, if if the pace is wrong, people get off out of sync when they're reading it, and they will they'll just drop off and stop reading. They get bored. And a lot of my readers, uh, a lot of my readers are just getting into reading, so you don't want to bore them so quickly. <laughs> you know. Yeah. You want, sort of like, you want that sort of feeling of like, you want that feeling of like, I don't want you to be able to put this book down. Yeah, I want them to want to continue reading beyond my book. So in order to do that, they've got to get through my book so fast that they're looking for the next thing to read. And if it's not a next Amulet book, then they're going to go read something else. <laughs> You're so trying to give them literary momentum. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's like a, a Super Mario Kart, you know? Like a, right. <laughs> you know, it's like the, the little, uh, the arrows. Yeah, uh, we're gonna get you power sliding, boost. Yeah. power sliding back into the library. Yeah, just just boost boosting it, uh, boosting <laughs> the reading the reading enjoyment, you know. And, and then you know, look at look at all the positive net effects that could that could, that you could that that might come out of that, you know, where kids are learning about other perspectives and new fields that they've never thought of before because someone wrote about it in a book you know and i thought books were particularly strong in an age where so much of our content is created by multiple people mm. um, not that I, I love movies i love them so much i love video games so much but they are created by many many hands and many many minds so it, it's not a person speaking with you and you may you know it, 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 you know, it, as a as a viewer, you may think that it is somebody, just like one person talking to you, but it's not. It's like a big group effort. Now, if you read a book, it is one person speaking to you, and that is very, very unique. That's not a, like, you know, you're not, you know, if you're, like, looking to talk to somebody and you want to, you know, you want to, you often want to talk to just one person like a person, a human being <laughs> that you can trust or something and sit in a room with them and then, and then have a good conversation, not like a giant focus group. <laughs> you know, if you're looking to yeah. sort out a problem, maybe some people are so confident, have so much self-confidence that going into a focus group setting works for them. But I think that on the majority, the majority of people on this planet, they want to just hear from one person and books yeah. offer that in a way that movies don't. Yeah, and I like again not to not to disparage movies, and I'll get back to that in a sec. But like, I love movies. With, I mean, that's, of course, no, yeah, yeah like I, love, I love. I'm a cinema our, guy. <laughs> yeah, our, our conversations on the the flight forums and stuff were often about movies, at least as much as they were about comics, probably more. Um, yes. And you know, we talked about things in cinematic using cinematic language, you know, pretty yes. often. Um, Oh shoot! Now I forgot where I was going. But like, 
like a a work by an and this is the same for really good movies maybe i think like they they haven't had their edges sound sanded down uh -huh. by being tumbled in a sort of um like you said the focus group process or that sort of thing and it's always nice yeah. when you get something that has like a little bit of fuzzy texture to it a little bit of um like that yeah. authorial uh yeah. i don't know it just sparkles a little bit brighter yeah and yeah and, and that's uh, like that's the thing about miyazaki's films right um that in animation to be able to see that in animation it's very rare on a big scale like his movies however he ends up having to do so much of the work right he actually he's there keyframing everything himself and no one knows where the movie goes because they have to wait on him they, they, there's no script He's just drawing it, <laughs> and that's why you get it. You get you get you get all the weird ugliness and also the weird beauty. Accidentally, it just happens on the way to to the finish line, um, and it can't be replicated, unfortunately. You know, uh, so um, uh, so yeah. I mean, I, I I love I love that stuff too, and it's so hard to have it to see it in animation unless you're. Like doing it on a smaller scale, like you know, uh, my friend Don Hertzfeld, who does his work, I feel like he's he's on the level of Miyazaki and those filmmakers because he has like that authorial voice that you're talking about. There's a there's a, there's art to the work. It's it's very you know um, authentic, uh, and and as much as I love the films that they make in animation studios, I love them. You know, I, I love Spider Man, the the new um, you know and the, mm -hmm. the Spider Man. So it was fantastic, you know, and I, I love I like almost everything Pixar does and Disney too, you know, um, but like as hard as they try to get that authorial um, voice and vision, it's, it's, it's always, it's, it's very, very difficult to, to, to maneuver that type of, um, uh, that type of vision at that scale with that many people, with that, with many, all those responsibilities. Now I can't help but think Probably. about I can't help but think about Speed Racer, which is a movie yeah. that I was convinced would be awful, and you at the time told everybody, "No, go see this movie." Would you say that that is one of those films that manages to capture that sort of magic? It is certainly yeah. a unique film. Yeah, it, it does. I mean, it's a it's it's a work of art. Um, yeah, I mean, I can go on about Speed. We could make this whole thing about Speed Racer. <laughs> I've got a class on it. Um, yeah, All it's, right, so uh, tune in for tune in for chapter two where we just talk about speed racing for three hours. Well, I'm, I wasn't the only one. There was a lot. I mean, Amy was Amy was really on it before I was, and I think Brian Lee O'Malley was uh, talking about it, and it just his the way he had talked about it was was really what um, I think probably piqued my interest. Actually, I'm I'm interested in art that is probably ahead of its time and if it's ahead of its time how do we know if we're not in that time because we're not it's it's ahead of us <laughs> right <laughs> but as a kid and as an artist growing up i've always i've always been fascinated by the projects that i would i would watch and think there's something really interesting about this and and people are not in, they're not liking it partly because I think it's it's foreign to them. It's weird to them. Mm. It's not it's not what they are expecting to like, and maybe they like it, which is why they don't like it because they don't like something that they don't know. <laughs> yeah, you know. And so maybe with Speed Racer, you're watching and going like, ah, oh, this is, you know, like people didn't, you know, they were they were put off by how different it was. And I, what was really interesting about the opening sequence of that movie, which I think is one of the greatest opening sequences, like since probably Citizen Kane, <laughs> honestly, <laughs> I really do think it's one of the greatest opening sequences in cinema is that it breaks so many of the rules that people rules, mm. there should not be any rules in, in my opinion, in, in art really, but the, the rules of cinema storytelling where you're supposed to, you know, keep it, um, uh, you're not supposed to use flashbacks the way that they, they did. They use flashbacks in the way that comics always have been utilizing them on a regular basis. It's accepted in comics format. It's accepted in novels. But for some reason, people said you can't do it in cinema. 
And they went ahead and did it. And I think a lot of the people who believed the otherwise did not like that. And if you're willing to go with it, that opening sequence is incredibly powerful yeah. because they, they, they work with time, the time, you know, when you're making a film, I feel like you're sculpting with time. And, you know, if you could sculpt with time, why not go as far as they did with that film? And just, they put a lot into the hands of the viewers to believe in them, to make that sequence work. So that by the end of the sequence, the emotional impact, if you've, if you've had faith in the process that they're showing you, uh, it should be, it should just be, it just pack a wallop. You know, just like that's mm. a that's a, that that punch, <laughs> that emotional punch at the end of it. I think is is, I mean, I don't know. I'm like breathless when I watch that sequence. <laughs> I have it on my computer. I'm serious. I watch it. I watch that sequence. I watch. I watch the opening to see Speed Racer so many times um, for inspiration. Yeah. I if it, I mean, it sounds like people are coming around too because every now yeah, and then you'll see it on Twitter it'll pop up and people will be like, Speed Racer is great. I'm like, yeah. It got to be an open mind. It's got, it requires an open mind. And, and those types of things are going to be, um, uh, you know, um, that people are not going to like a lot of that work. So it's, it's one of the reasons whenever I see filmmakers do something where uh, the audience doesn't uh, interface with it in, in like, um, uh, you know, like in a way where they just celebrate it in the moment, um, I find, and yet I find like maybe two or three people out there who absolutely love it like it's like they're mm. you know the thing that they they hold on to like i think of filmmakers like m night Shyamalan, who's done that uh i think of Zack snyder who has done that these are filmmakers who are often considered divisive because a lot of the content they make is so off, like seemingly off the rails yet <laughs> the people who do love it love it so deeply that it's like ingrained in their lives in like a really like really deep way <laughs> you know like a mm. very meaningful way uh and so the to me when i see something like that i know that there's art there i, I <laughs> and I, that we're we don't have we're, we're seeing that can't we're not seeing the forest from the trees we're still in the trees so we don't understand why the art is there mm. and, and me as a forager of art as someone who looks at other art and just you know, as an editor, as for flight, that's how I did it. I went and found people who I thought should that that had that, that had that 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 instinct, and that clearly the world did not see that in them, and they just needed somebody to say, "No, I do see you. Here's the space for you to go ahead and make something." Um, and um, and and I feel that 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 the the best curators. Um, tend to do that I, I think of people i mean like walt disney or or even T quentin tarantino is actually a really good um person to 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 look at because of his the way he does that with music he seems to find ways to try to he takes music that people have overlooked and he finds so much life in these little overlooked pockets of music that he reinvents it <laughs> like he, he represents it to you it, it could be commercial music from a commercial he'll reintroduce it to you in the form of like you know once upon a time in hollywood or something and it and it takes on a whole new life it's like as if you'd never never saw it for what it really was and he did you know and that is a that's a unique talent i think amongst um artists if they can curate really you can find the life in something and take the ingredients and and really just like put it up on the stage and and, and help um help people see it I think that the, I think that's um, I think it's a very very valuable skill to have, um, but yeah, Speed Racer definitely has it. Uh, I mean, it's, Adam Sandler has it. <laughs> he does. I mean, his movies are just full of it, <laughs> uh, which is so which is interesting. That's about uh, he's a he's a really interesting actor. That feels um, like another thing we could talk for three hours about. Yeah, we could talk a long time about that. Yeah, I mean, it, Adam, you know, you see pockets of it, like when when certain artists, like Paul Thomas Anderson, he he recognized that in Adam Sandler and put him in Punch Drunk Love, which I think is, yeah. you know, it's, I mean, that's a that is that's that's a really good movie, you know. So, um, so I don't know. There, it, it happens. I think I think um, um, it, the reason why we don't. See see it being celebrated as much these days is that I think we have very little uh, uh, discourse about the merits of art. Um, mm -hmm. We don't see a lot of um, academic 
or not, or just just casual discussion about um, about uh, the meaningfulness about of art. You know, we 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 often end up looking at somebody who's actually just selling the art, and we listen to the voices that are selling the art, and I, they have the you know the that's fine advertising and all that stuff they have a place for that too uh, there's a place for them you know but um but i've i've noticed as the years went on that we've we've lost a lot of our best critics we don't have mm. a lot of you know roger eberts i mean I, I don't always agree with roger ebert but i always agree i always felt that he was um he was he was saying what he meant and and, yeah. and that that meant a lot to me because i i knew that if i just listened to his opinion even if i didn't agree with it that I knew that I was hearing some kind of truth, and, yeah. and we don't have that many. We don't have that many critics like that anymore. So, yeah. and that's partly because they don't get paid. Because people <laughs> don't. That's what it is. If they if they get paid to do critical work, if people if we just paid critics and said, you know, your your criticism is awesome, and I'll pay you all this money to be a critic, then more people would be critics. Yeah, it is a. There's some weird changes happening. I want to, but I want to go back and talk. A okay, so now we're like completely off the rails, but that's okay. We are completely off the rails. I, I want to go back <laughs> to um, a few things you said a little bit earlier, talking about authorship. Um, like the old, the old advice is uh, when you are an author um, to write the book you want to read. Um, as you were talking about Amulet, you were talking. Um, you're using a lot of language and uh, around like designing it for kids and stuff. And so I'm wondering sort of uh, what your take is on like designing it for an audience versus it being uh, versus that sort of like fuzzy edge authorship thing that you're doing for yourself. Yeah. Uh, well, when I'm writing for kids, I'm often writing for a young version of me. So when I'm writing for kids, it's not that different than writing something like Daisy Cutter where I was just writing it for me at the time. The, the difference is that I have to be empathetic towards my former self. Does that make sense? Like I got to look back and go, what do I want to tell that kid? Mm -hmm. So, um, and now, now that I'm a dad and I have my kids here and also I talk to kids, I feel like I'm just a lot more comfortable knowing that, Oh, well, they're just, they're just people. Like they're just younger people that are going to be regular old adults <laughs> at some point. Uh, and, and I'm a lot more comfortable talking with them. I don't see it as a, as anything like that, that gap has now like, you know, become it's, it's not, it's not a gap anymore. It's a very easy to open door for me, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I, um, you know, I, 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 so I still do channel that same instinct of writing for myself. It's just that I have to remember that when I was younger, I had different thoughts and feelings and, and, and try to remember that. Yeah. Sort of different tastes probably. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. So we've been talking for, according to this timer for a little bit, a little minutes. while now, I'm going to look <laughs> at this sheet of questions that I, I, told yes, we, that I would yeah, better, yes, we better get through this. Um, I'm, and I would like to know, so again, Amulet is a decade-long process, uh -huh. at least, again. Um, a reader asked, and I was wondering as well, how you um, map or consider your characters and the way they grow throughout that, uh, throughout that long process. Um, how do, yeah, how do you adapt to characters? So this here how do you adapt to characters evolve in a way that may challenge your plans um yeah it's uh i want that to happen that's the fun stuff as a writer if i can just take a back seat to my characters rolling i know things are working i it, i don't want to have to like go and like wake up my characters <laughs> and go like come on guys it's time to work <laughs> we gotta get into the story and you gotta you gotta do this and you gotta you know if i'm doing that they're not gonna the actors are not gonna perform <laughs> and so the book the book feels like work to read mm -hmm. you know? like if you can surprise yourself hopefully you can surprise yeah your if i feel like the character is like just like a shooting star and i've got a net on it and I'm just rolling. I'm like, whoa, we got to go. Where is it going? What's happening? That feeling that I, I if I wow. feel that that's happening, that means that's like the best stuff, right? Like you're, you're, when you're a writer and it's just, just pulling you along, like, you know, you've got something. And it's so it's a lot like fishing, 
you know, and it's a lot. Um, I, I, I equate it to fishing because you don't know where the fish are. <laughs> you know, they're out there in the ocean and, you know, you think you hope that you have all the right tools and the right, you know, the right skills and things like that to net the fish. Um, but it's just a, it's sometimes just a matter of time. And yeah, you just got to put the time in and know how to yeah. respond when well, you, you got to know the conditions, you know, you got to think about the weather and, you know, the, the metaphorical weather <laughs> of, of writing and, yeah. and, and get yourself in the right conditions and then net the best results. So, uh, yeah, the characters evolve sort of like, um, essentially on their own if it's, if it's things are working well and I just follow th that. And do they challenge my plans? No, because my plans were always to follow them. Oh yeah. Oh man. Um, have there been any really, really big, big surprises as you've gone along? Like anything you that you just you stood back from the drawing board and you said, oh, um, "Whoa, yeah. I did not expect this." Um, little bits, like just how the scene plays out. Yeah, I was like, "Oh, that could, you know, that's surprising." And those are, those are the best moments in the series, actually, when things like that happen. You know, things like. All the trellis flashback sequences, you know, uh, uh, what the memories that they might they might uncover. Um, uh, Max, like learning about Max, I didn't really know much about him when he showed up, and he became a really big character in the story. Uh, and yeah, so so they 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 kind of just you know uh, they kind of reveal themselves over time, um, uh, and. Uh, yeah, so I don't know. I mean, it's all uh, hopefully it's surprising. I want it to be an adventure for myself too. I, I don't want this to be like, you know, me going, "I told you this is this character was gonna, <laughs> was gonna do this thing," and I finally put it on a book, and now you got to see it, you know, and now you like it. I, just, uh, I don't want to be a grumpy old guy. I just, I, I just, I, you know, I'm not, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm just a cameraman on the journey with my characters. It's the way I like to roll. Uh, and so it's like we're a team, and we're like let's go, let's see what happens. And oh man, that's interesting. Let's let's. And I saw this thing in this other movie that was really cool. I'm gonna add that here too, and then <laughs> we'll just we'll just we'll just combine these things, and then we'll make this uh, we'll make this awesome book. Yeah. So related to so your character really related to your characters changing and evolving and surprising you across the across the series. Um, from a more technical standpoint, how do you adjust, a reader asks, how do you adjust for the inevitability of your drawing style changing over time and how much consideration do you give to visual consistency across the volumes? Um, yeah, uh, I, tried to, I tried to lock in the designs early. Uh, one of the things I, I, because I have new characters in books all the time, um, one of the things that I do is I draw the new characters over and over again. I just make new sequences with them, sketch sequences out um, just constantly. Uh, and they end up um, evolving through the, the drafts. You know, you, you can see the, the you know, it's, a, it's just like a, a designing for an animated film, except I have to do it in like a tiny window. <laughs> I have to do it really, really quick. It has to be like a day. <laughs> I don't have that much time to do the character designs. So usually, uh, you know, it's like a few iterations, maybe about a, a two or three or four or five days of, of different revisions on a character's design or a costume design. Costumes can also take quite a bit of time as well. Um, and how do I stay consistent? Well, that's just... It's it. The, the truth is, it's not consistent. So if you, go to, <laughs> if you go back through the books, you're gonna see like you know they, the faces look like potatoes, you know, <laughs> start, and they eventually form into something that looks pretty, you know, pretty well, uh, well rendered. And that's that's just a matter of uh, of learning my design language over time. I also sketch in almost all of my fans' books when I go to signings, and I do really quick sharpie sketches. And so I've drawn my characters so many times. And I think that over time, uh, they just get better incrementally, like just a tiny little bit each time I do it. Uh, and so I use that as, a, I think of them as my free throws, like in basketball. <laughs> when I play basketball, I'll sit in the gym for like three hours and just shoot over and over and over again. And eventually, you know, muscle memory and everything 
you know, understands what it needs to do to get that ball in the hoop. I think the same way about my cartoons. If I just do it enough times, my, my muscle memory just takes over and, and, and it just knows how to draw the characters. So that when I go to doing the book to do the book, I don't have to worry about it. It's just the characters just, I, I, I was like, Oh, it's like a camera, just shoot the camera, shoot the scene character needs to be this angle here and that and uh, this way and this way, that way and, and and i have um control over the uh, of the of the drawing elements yeah i mean just look at garfield over the age like this is yes. a pro problem everybody's had to yes <laughs> had to address at some point so he just kind of yeah used to be shaped like a rectangle yeah. just like little little garfield old garfield and uh new garfield like just yeah. got the, the big <laughs> Um, so related to designing things, I was like, do you, do you intentionally try to give yourself fun things to design? Um, yeah. you know, like I'm thinking of the octopus creatures, there's octopus creatures in book one, you've got a, about 150 different types of flying vehicles throughout the series. Like, is this a goal you set for yourself? Are you like, I want to come up with something I want to. No, it's not a goal. It's just how I deal with it. I gotta get through the book, so I gotta make it fun. I gotta, <laughs> I'll add fun stuff to draw. I go, okay, yeah, this, this is a scene. I gotta have to do something really cool, like right. uh, um, Ron Cobb inspired, uh, like vehicles or something like that, you know. Uh, and yeah, just trying to make it fun, mix it up for myself. And and if I'm having fun, the reader's having fun. Right. Um, related to that, a reader asks. How do you stay motivated? I'm assuming over the course of like a project this big. Okay. Um, I don't know. I, I mean, I go, is I there any school. secret to it? Uh, <laughs> well, like knowing people read the books. You know, these days it's not that hard to stay motivated to finish the stuff because everyone wants the books now and they're bugging me all the time. Uh, so I'm not. I'm, I'm motivated enough. I. Lately, it hasn't been motivation that I'm looking at uh, that, that I've been working on, but really pacing properly and making sure that I'm doing the work within the frame, within a sustainable um, way of doing it so that I can do it for a long period of time. As I get older, I want to make sure that I can produce books for everybody um, on a regular basis. So I don't want to I don't want to sacrifice future books for today's books is mm -hmm. what I'm saying. Because uh, I know that I'll be doing those future books, and I know that that's what the reader event would would rather have me do. You know, they would rather have me take a little bit more time on the current book to make sure that the next one comes out. So I have to think about that. Uh, and staying motivated, um, um, it, it's uh, I don't know. It used to be an issue. It used to be a real big issue before people were reading the books, but now a lot of people read the books. Now, I've, if I just walked you down my neighborhood, I've had people just go, hey, are you the author of Amulet? <laughs> yeah, you had, you had point. Amulet Day at Mariner Stadium. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, like I might not be super popular in the comics world, but outside in the in the other world, it's it's a little bit nutty. So, I mean, in a good way. And, and people are enthusiastic. It's it's very hard to um, to, to, to ignore that. So there is, there's constant motivation, um, it, it, but I'm trying to do it wisely so that I don't burn myself out. I don't burn out the books. I don't burn out the story. Um, and I want to, I want to, I want to do everything just, just right. Um, so yeah, that's a good question though. Do you have any tips for like keeping yourself healthy when you're working at a desk all these um, hours every day? Well, so I draw really, really fast. I try to draw. I, I, I've come to a point where I, my the, my style is reflective of a very quick drawing process. And I I, I look I look at people like um, like like some of my 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 peers that are heroes to me. Um, that would uh, and I would I would count um, Dave Pilkey and Jeff Kinney and and, and Reina as well. Um, I think I look to them um, in their style. It's a lot more. Um, it's it's more economical. It's the really strong cartoon design language that they can produce very very quickly. You know, mine is a little more like you know it's 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 it, there's it's more ornate. So I need help like with from Jason to help me paint these things because you know it's it wasn't I didn't do this from from a practical perspective. I did it because I just wanted to see Miyazaki style uh, mm -hmm. animations type, type work in a comic book. 
uh, and it just takes more time to produce that type of thing. Um, and so, um, yeah, so I, I, um, I try not to be at the desk. That's what it comes down to. So I go outside, I'll work in the garden, I'll uh, go mountain biking. When we can go back to go mountain biking, I'll, I'll be mountain biking. And uh, I just get out. I, I play a lot of basketball. Um, I, uh, we have a, a small trampoline in our, um, uh, in our house. It's like a little, just like a, it's just something that only one person can stand on. And, uh, you know, you know, we have that, I have, I have a really nice exercise bike. So trying to stay healthy physically is really, really important. You watch Miyazaki do calisthenic stretches and everything with his, his studio. It's not, I mean, he's doing that for a reason. He's not, he's not like sitting there going, this is fun. You know, he's doing this because like, he's like, you guys got to move your joints or else they're, you're going to lose your joints. <laughs> <laughs> so you mentioned Miyazaki again. So we have to address this somewhere. There's a question in here about um, the influence of Ghibli films on your work, um, which, you know, you've said here, you've said, you've mentioned it already a few times here. You mentioned it elsewhere. Um, is there, what it, can, are you able to identify a certain quality? And we talked about, um, that sort of authorial uh, individual quality to a work. Is there anything else um, that you see in Miyazaki films that has led them to leave, you know, like leave such an impression on you? Um, I don't know. I, 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 I go back to My Neighbor Totoro. I think I've, I've been thinking about this a lot. Uh, I, I don't know that it was actually the art of Totoro or the the film technical film itself that I was inspired by when I watched it, I was actually really inspired by the lives being led in the film, the dad and the kids, <laughs> and so I feel like I've in some sense kind of created a life in comics that reflects that life where I'm just the author dad and my kids get to run around in the forest and it was to my mind it when I watched it it felt like heaven to me. <laughs> mm. There was something about it, and and it wasn't it wasn't the, you know, it wasn't the art and the craftsmanship. I didn't think about it as like, oh my gosh, that was so amazingly well animated, which and it was, and it's done so well. But it was really what it was trying to to depict, the, the, you know, and and I don't know if Miyazaki's own life was like that at all. Um, and maybe it's a, it's a situation where the one who's farthest from the waterfall hears it best. <laughs> um, but that vision of, uh, of, of a family life like that seems so idyllic. And I, I was so inspired and, and calmed by it that I, I wanted to create work that felt a little bit like that too. Um, you know, I, I think that it would, it, it's a gift to another artist or another person who isn't an artist is watching these things. It gives them a sense of, um, uh, the, I don't know, there, that there's some good things in the world and, you know, there's a place you can go to just watch these things and, and feel, ex experience it for a little bit. And it was really nice. So you know, I've, heard, used, I've heard other people praise his films for, um, for being really well observed in a way that you don't see in a lot of, I mean, especially animated films, maybe even just films in general, like mm -hmm. his characters behave more like real people or, or feel more in touch with actual people than, um, than you see represented in, in stories a lot. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that he's, a, he's a good observer of um, human behavior. And, mm. and I think that that's a, that's the cornerstone of many of our favorite authors. Uh, he looks a lot to children's literature, I believe. Um, the writers of children's literature is like his, that those are his touchstones. Um, and I think that that uh, is reflected in, in the work uh, in a way that maybe some other animators don't, don't they don't have that. You know? I mean, I think a lot, of, a lot of people do look at stuff that's within their medium. And so their work becomes kind of like a, a new twist on the medium, you know, like their DJs remixing. <laughs> Miyazaki is uh, similar to um, uh, uh, Miyamoto at uh, at Nintendo, uh, like where they take things from life and study from, you know, just going outside to their backyard or something, and then turning it into the art. Uh, so I think I think I like that. Yeah. 
Uh, we're talking about animated films. Um, say, if Amulet were animated, here is a question from a reader. If Amulet were animated, who would voice Miskit? Who would voice Cogsley? Uh, uh, and and you know, like in general, what do you what do you what do you think about your character voices? Yeah. So like, to answer the reader, um, it's whoever the producers choose, <laughs> <laughs> whoever the director oh, the director chooses uh, to to voice Miskit and voice Cogsley would be the person who does that. Um, who who did I pick? I don't know. I I don't really I don't really have a very particular voice in my mind. When, yeah, when you were when you're writing, does but I do tell. Okay, so okay, that's not entirely because <laughs> uh, I often uh, I'll often say that I would love to have um, uh, Liam Neeson be Misfit. <laughs> I felt like I felt like it should have. I think Miss. I felt like Misfit should have the voice of someone with the seriousness, like this weighted, like this, this weighty voice that, you know, gravity. Like, cause, cause I want to, yeah, gravitas. Like I want him to <laughs> have them that. And then he looks like he does. And you're like, Oh, he's so cute. He's like, no, I'm, I'm <laughs> <laughs> Where, I think that'd be fun. Going to be that'd be good. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> and, uh, Cogsley, I don't know, I guess uh, a lot of people think that he would sound like a plumber. Uh, but, mm. um, I, I, but because I was I was partly inspired by Keen Sue, I I often hear Keen's voice, uh, Keen Sue, who's also a flight artist, and is mm -hmm. the creator of Jellyby and March Grand Prix, uh, good oh, friend yes. of ours, one of our, yeah. one of our one of our best friends here. Yeah, he uh, he he would have been Cogsley. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, do you have do you uh, can you sort of talk about your feet? You mentioned you know. Who would do the voice? Oh, you know, whoever they pick. Um, what are your sort of thoughts about seeing your work reinterpreted as a live action film, as a animated film was? Um, I don't really have that many thoughts about it because I, I just think I've already done my thing. I've, I've said my piece, that's my book. It's got my name on it. People know that's where I'm at, you know? So I don't, I, I, uh, I used to be in film, you know? So I understand um, what it would be like for the filmmakers. You know, they have so many moving parts to deal with uh, that I don't want to be one of the things that gets in their way. I don't want to be one of the moving parts that, you know, harms the the progress of the production. Um, so in that way, I try not to think about it. I, I just I just go, it's not it's just not my thing. And I've told that to the producers and I've, they've even made me an executive producer. <laughs> Uh, I think partly because they're like, oh, he doesn't, he's, he doesn't want to interfere. Okay, come on in. <laughs> no, I don't know if that's, if that's exactly what happened, but, uh, but, but they were, they were very appreciative to have a creator who uh, understood their process. And I was like this for you guys, right? As an editor, I don't want to get in your hair. I, I think that a creative, creator, creative directors that really succeed, in my opinion, are the ones who trust their talent the most. I think you, you can. The biggest creative decision that you make is choosing who you work with, and once you do that, you got to just trust them, even when it seems uncomfortable. You got to trust them. You just got to roll with it and just write out the decision. Because trying to get in there and and reconfigure things and mix things up, it always turns out poorly. So <laughs> even if like the, the whoever's making the thing is coming out with something that isn't what you wanted. You you kind of just have to just tr let it let it go let it let let them do their thing because we all actually never know until it's done with art it's not done until it's done and it's not done especially it's especially not done until it's in the hands of the audience and they mm. will decide and it, you know so uh, I you know I'm sure everyone has been wrong about certain stories and media and stuff like that and if we take that as a lesson we got to know that okay with art it's there is a there's a, a lot of risk involved in terms of how people are going to process it you can't you can't really guarantee that everyone's going to love it out of the gate so um i, I have found that a lot of the best films and books were in some sort of distress <laughs> And, and it was sh like shrouded with doubt <laughs> on its way to the final 
and somebody and some group of people were strong enough to keep it kind of just keep that vision intact and let it roll despite everyone's pro protesting. <laughs> hmm. uh, and then, and then the world decided that is what we were looking for. And, and then all the, all the, you know, people who might be the bean counters, or <laughs> I don't want to, I don't want to vilify any bean counters because they're often like the most open-minded people, actually. Uh, but I, I will take you to task a little bit, though. I think you're underselling. I think the role that you and and Keen, <laughs> Keen Su as well played in flight, and it, and it was never. A, I mean, it is absolutely true to everything you just said. Uh -huh. Um, but I mean, you have to acknowledge there was, there was an editorial element there, yes. which, which took the form often of, is this, are you telling this, this story the best way you can? Yeah. And, and is this story living up to, you know, the best that it can be? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a, it's, it's very, um, it's it's a it's a difficult those are difficult waters to navigate I guess and and it's hard to it, it's easier to hear from somebody else who does it I think and that was the secret I think to the success of the editorial part of flight is that we all respected each other and so when you heard from the and and not just just it's not just a matter of respect but everyone understood that the other person telling them these things are going through it themselves. Mm -hmm. And so it was easier to process a criticism, you know, and we always made sure that every time there was a criticism, there was also a compliment or something they did well. I think it was important to have both, you know, to encourage while also, you know, presenting the criticism. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and to also be someone who understands that process, like to totally understands it and has done it, you know? So, uh, yeah, I think that was, I think that was good. It was also good that it wasn't all coming from me. I was the editor, but I, I felt like you were an editor and Keen was an editor. Uh, Jason was an editor. Um, uh, Phil Craven was an editor. Amy, mm -hmm. you know, my wife, Amy, uh, she was an editor. So when, when they, you know, put their comments out there, uh, like there was like kind of a family, that yeah. you can trust uh, to to help help guide the the artist, and we we did that. Yes, you're right. We did that with a few of the artists in there, um, but um, um, and, and so it's it's a good point. I think some people are just at different stations. You know, if they don't have the confidence, they're not going to be able to do the things that we just talked about. Like just roll with it and take on all the responsibility and tell the story exactly the way they think they should tell it you know a lot of people don't have that confidence yet you know and so there are stages to this yes like you, you do want to you want to make sure that you you develop talent properly and that's something that is is kind of lacking in the arts is that i feel that there isn't that much established talent development mm -hmm. uh, in the way that like in sports they have established talent development programs for all the sports they, they invest tons of money in researching analytics and all these different types of things to figure out who's going to be the best uh, player on the team, who's going to be the best management, uh, you know, on the team, they, you know, because there's so much money there, right? And maybe people don't think there there's big money in the arts, but if you go to Japan or to Europe, you're going to see that uh, that comics. I mean, you know, like the Tintin and all that stuff. These are huge things, like elsewhere. Uh, and so, um, you know, I think it's it's good to have that kind of analytical mind. Uh, going into this stuff, and in terms of this, in terms of talent development as well, and um, and it's something that uh, I hope that we see more of as graphic novels increase uh, in their popularity, which they are, like they're growing in popularity by um, leaps and bounds at the moment. This is middle age, uh, middle middle age, middle middle grade graphic novels. Uh, from middle aged authors, you know, <laughs> middle grade, middle middle grade. Is, is one of one of the things I heard when when we were sort of in the middle of flight, sort of so like middle to early middle two thousands, um, was you know like at, at San Diego Comic Con, and in similar circles talking to people, there was a lot of like, hey, graphic novels, graphic novels are up and coming. Graphic novels are going to be a big thing. It feels like the I guess depending on who you listen to, but it feels like the because people are still saying the same things. Do you have a take on sort of where graphic novels are now? 
Um, yeah, we're still, we're still in early stages, honestly. Uh, it's not, um, you know, there's this, you, you'll always hear the, the stories where it's like, they've arrived. <laughs> like Mouse and Watchmen. It's like, we're now in the mainstream of graphic novels, 1980s and 90s. We've arrived. <laughs> <laughs> it's blankets. It's a huge, huge you know, success. It's, you know, and... Uh, um, Persepolis, and we've arrived. And we keep hearing that. It's like, what, what are you talking about? We've always been here. It's <laughs> <laughs> comics have been here before written language. Come on, you know, mm. like uh, comics predate novels. You know, because because the letters on the page of a novel they are pictures as well, and they're just pictures that have been, you know, used so often that they mean you know other things to the point where they don't even they just take it for granted that you know a font is a drawing and we know that because yeah. we have to make them we have to make the glyphs they're 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 complicated drawings on their own so um they look yeah. just little drawings we all agree on the meaning of yeah so comics are an ancient this is an ancient form of art you know, and you know, it's um, it's the one that you can always kind of lean, like, kind of rely on in in, the, in times where, like, people get stressed out. They often go to comics actually because it's a you know, it's there. There's this there's a disarming quality to it. Maybe because they're so old and because we're so familiar with them, it's like seeing your family, it's like your parents, <laughs> see, Pete, see Snoopy, and you're like, oh, Snoopy. <laughs> You know, or, oh, Calvin and Hobbes, oh, yeah. You know, everyone, and, and I'm sure they're doing it with the Amulet or Raina's comics. You know, they're like, oh, Raina, my friend. You know, they, or Dogman. So, um, yeah, it's it's ancient. So with the new stuff that's coming out, it's just another, we're going back to, we're going back to seeing it uh, back on the big stage again. Um, and the question, though, I think is, is are, are, are the talent, behind the the new wave of popularity are they ready to handle all mm. of that noise are they ready to handle the responsibility and um i i think i think that with the internet and interviews like this like we're talking about like the people are going to have access to something like this which we wouldn't have had access to many years like 10 years ago we wouldn't have this conversation um you know they're going to get this kind of information and it's going to make them stronger so i i firmly believe like every every next generation is going to be better than the previous one as long as they have access to the tools um so right now my focus has been first off get the books out and then also help them get tools for to make those books um and and that's that's one of the things that i've been thinking about in the back of my mind is like trying to make better art supplies and stuff I, I, you, you know you've heard me talk about it i do i do, yep. I do that it's, it, would, it would take so much time and so many resources but it's in the back of my mind i'm thinking about it i've got one more series that i want to do that's like super foundational work that you could put in a classroom and you could use it as if it was the encyclopedia <laughs> you know but it would be all about like uh jobs it would be like how to like you know process you know the thoughts of working in different fields of work that's that's what i wanted to do but yeah um you mentioned briefly um sort of you know amulets amulets characters having a life with uh with its readers um mm -hmm. along those sort of that sort of line a reader was asking now, how do you feel knowing that amulet inspired a whole a whole generation that Amulet inspired a whole generation, introducing them to the world of art, comics, and fantasy sci-fi. Clearly, clearly these books are in that role. Yeah, um, let's see, I'm gonna process that. So, um, <laughs> yeah, it, I mean, it's, yeah, fantasy, sci-fi, I, I do, I mean, I have, let's see, and like just on my shelf here, I mean, I have like, you know, I have, you know, textbooks on stuff like that. I got my <laughs> Joseph Campbell here. I've got, you know, um, and, you know, I've got, I, uh, I don't know. I, I, I have, I've thought about it partly because I know that Miyazaki had thought, thought about it too. Um, uh, I've just done a lot of research about, um, 
you know, about stories, just storytelling and how we process the stories and all that stuff. So it's, I guess as, as it's happening and like my friends are sending me videos of people um, giving sermons in church, like based with pictures of amulet on, on there. <laughs> Somebody sent me a video. Um, uh, my friend Kevin sent me a video of being at a, at a, um, at a church service. And he was like, he, he shot it and he's like, my pastor just put your, put a page of your comic on there. And, uh, and he's teaching, he's teaching with your comic. And then to see like, um, uh, like amulet, uh, on, on, in the subway in New York City, you see the sub the subway tile art that they have, and some kid is actually holding the uh, an amulet book. And I think I don't know if it was it was intentional to put the book there, or if the kid just happened that kid who was the model for that for that um, uh, the, the the tile mosaic happened to have a copy of amulet with them. I mean, I don't know the backstory. The artist would know. Uh, but now there's a copy of amulet in the hands a clutched in the hands of a kid in a mosaic. <laughs> in the subway in New York city. And, you know, you see stuff like that and you realize, Oh yeah, you're part of, you're becoming part of modern myth, like part of the cultural conversation, like star Wars was, but I studied film. I studied star Wars and, you know, it's like, I like a ton of that stuff. I, I, I always, always studied, studied, um, studied filmmakers who I believe were creating that kind of content. And, um, and so I don't know if that makes me more prepared, but I'm maybe more wary of the influence of all that stuff, maybe. But I think, uh, I think about I think, it a little bit. Like looking at this question, it reminds me of um, like, just quickly, uh, it reminds me of a time I was in the bookstore. This was after, this was, you know, like halfway through flight, like maybe flight volume five had been out. Um, and I was in the bookstore and I was, I thought to myself, I'm gonna go see what kind of books are on the graphic novel shelf. And that what I was expecting was to make, cause I knew, you know, I knew yourself and Raina were, were you know, and, and Jake were putting out um, books with Scholastic. Uh, and I was expecting to turn the corner and see, you know, like all these, you know, this book, that book, the other book. And then, you know, I spot here and there, there's a Kazu, there's a Raina, there's a Jake. Um, but I turned that corner and discovered that, oh wait, these shelves are, <laughs> Like these shelves are stocked with almost exclusively people I know from flight. You know, Keen's <laughs> Keen's Jellaby was on there, uh, Amulet was on there, Raina's books were on there. Uh, like kids were talking about Smile. I saw Missile Mouse from Jake, and had this experience of like, oh, wait a minute, are these guys now? Are these guys now the mainstream? Because when I got involved in flight, I I don't know you know, for my part, um, approached it kind of like, I like making comics. Comics is fun. Um, Kazu is presenting this opportunity um, to, to, you know, make comics with other people. Um, you know, why not? And I had never considered that it would, um, that it would end up with, you know, books on, you know, this career making it so, um, so I guess I guess I'm just thinking about the idea of like how legitimacy is made and how um, how we go from like being an aspiring artist just sort of like doing something you want to do to being you know to occupying the space on the shelves and I just wonder you know where were where were your thoughts on that when you were starting up flight um i don't know yeah i mean i was no no answer. it's just no i um uh, I, I did think about it because I, I came from other fields where i was already finding some success um where if i uh, working in architecture and then working in animation it wasn't like i was presented with no opportunities or there wasn't a lot. I actually just saw that comics, there was a, there was a, a very, um, I don't know about opportunity. I don't think opportunity is the right word, but I just felt like I used to surf. Okay. I was a surfer as a kid, you know? And so you, you know, you get good at sensing when the waves are, are, are wh where they're going to be. <laughs> you want to be in the right spot at the right time to catch the right wave, you know? 
And even though there was a huge lull in comics for years, I did sense that there was just a wave waiting to happen. Like I just knew that th that's just what's going to happen. That's just where it's going to be. And if I told someone that they'd think I was nuts back then. <laughs> Cause like I would have had to start it in the middle of like the, you know, basically I'd started all this in the middle of the collapse of the industry of the nineties, like comics industry collapse, you know? And, um, and so, uh, you know, I, but I thought like, no, it, it, regardless of that collapse, I do feel that the comics are going to be the mainstream. It's just going to be that way. Uh, and um, so it hasn't come as a surprise necessarily. Um, and, and, and it definitely didn't come as a surprise to Scott McCloud, who did our introduction. That's actually at the end of the flight book, his, his little thing. He actually predicted all of this as well. Um, <laughs> And I, so I don't know, I, I, um, I it took me years for me to kind of decide that I want to be part of having that responsibility. I was trying to run away from it like a punk kid. I don't want to, I didn't want to deal with it. You know, I wasn't ready to deal with life, you know, hmm. and, and I think a lot of comic artists come into this and they, when they get success, they're not ready to deal with life and they didn't really like, you know, s s go in there going, okay, I'm going to be a responsible adult. I'm going to do all these things. Um, Some of us are still figuring it out. Yeah, yeah. So it's totally fine. You know, everyone's <laughs> at a different station. I came into it in a very, very different perspective. I had been, you know, moderately successful at various other fields, and it looked like careers were about to start, you know. And then after 9-11, I felt like things were getting very serious. I thought, you know, things like this happen because of miscommunication. It, it, things like wars happen because people miscommunicate. That's what is happening. You know, it's it's a mis it's a massive miscommunication somewhere. A fire starts, and everyone's just trying to survive. That's usually what happens. And so, uh, knowing that cartoons had the ability to 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 bridge gaps, to 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 um, you know, to both quell and even you know create conflict. And in fact, it could happen. Uh, cartoons could do that. But cartoons have a really strong role to play in communicating between the people of different cultures. And so knowing that, I knew that there was like a, a, a real uh, serious um, responsibility that might come with it. Um, and, and, uh, and that I was hesitating uh, to, to accept at, when I started. And eventually I decided after 9-11, I'm going to accept this role. Let's let's make it. I'm I'm gonna take it a little bit more seriously. And that's why I did flight because I felt that the artists and flight were the kinds of people that should move away from other industry where they weren't as needed, honestly. Because animation had so much talent, there was like a traffic jam of talent. There's so much good like content that can be created. They just don't have enough venues for it. But nobody was going into comics, <laughs> and I thought that that was a. And I thought that that was um, not good for society, like just not good <laughs> for humans in general, <laughs> that we should have more cartoonists in cartooning. They should make books because they're important. And so I had a very different perspective coming in. It wasn't for career gain stuff. And, you know, it wasn't about making money. And I knew you can make money doing lots of different things. <laughs> this would not be the one, like I would not suggest draw like sitting and drawing at a car at a desk for hours on end to do these in like insanely difficult projects uh not a great way to just you know monetize your skills um <laughs> you know i mean you can make money okay but you know i don't want to i want a comfortable life but it's not it, it, it wasn't the, the the goal you know the money would come in they would be resources that i would need to marshal to to get to the right places throughout my life um and that's that's how i saw it um, you know, I, I think if I have had any advantages, it's probably that I do have that mindset for the business side of it. It's not one that I, I, um, worry about as much as like, I worry about my social service doing the art, what art work, <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, and cause that stresses me out more than anything. And, and so I wasn't surprised at the success um, of, of all this happening right now with middle grade graphic novels and all that stuff. I know that this is, I knew that this was the new mainstream. Um, I didn't know what form it would take. Uh, and, 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 and it's, it's been, it's been nice to see um, how, how things have, have, have rolled out. Um, I, I think that we're at a, at a, at a critical phase of, of this where we need to make it sustainable. It's something that I think people like you can train people into it. 
you know, we can make content that comes out on a regular basis that isn't going to, that it's going to help the retailers. You know, a lot of people think that, oh, getting a ton of books out helps the retailers. No, no, no. It's better to get really high quality content in small packages out to the retailers that they could resell over and over and over again, <laughs> over like talk to a retailer. If you, if they, if they can lean on a watch, like a copy of Watchmen, just knowing that if they just had it on the shelf that somebody will pick it up, you know, it's some one less thing they have to worry about. Whereas if there's like the new hot property, they have to worry about that making sure that the, their, their customers have it, you know, but they'll always have a Watchmen. You know, they'll always have a mouse, you know, or Persepolis. Mm -hmm. uh, they'll, they'll now always have Raina's smile and sisters. They'll just be there. And they'll know that the, they can just, they just don't need, have to think. It's, oh, it says Raina. We'll just make sure they have this many copies and just it's, it'll be sitting there. And hopefully they think that way about Amulet. So I think when going into this stuff, I think people, I think it's a nice idea. I'm trying to, you know, I, I don't think, I don't see too many artists talk about this. Maybe it's uncomfortable for them, but I, I think they should think about um, the best business practices uh, for everyone. To, if you're, if you're, if you have a, if you're a good, if you're good at managing your time and, and also your efforts to making sure that you make something that is sustainable. Uh, I feel that you're, you're like a good, like a good um, blood cell, <laughs> <laughs> you know, in the street. And then that affects things around you in a positive way and the ecosystem, you know, you know, hums along and things are happy and things are good. Uh, and so I think, I think about that stuff a lot, a lot. So um, that's why most of my friends aren't comic artists. Um, these days it's, it's often someone who's like a bookstore owner. Uh, you know, one of my best friends runs a tire shop, um, <laughs> you know, he, he, and, and, uh, and another friend runs a bike shop. And these are the people I talk with. Cause I just, you know, and it, it gives me a way to see what, um, life is like for a small business somewhere. Uh, and then I can apply that to helping the bookstores and comic shops that might sell my books. You mentioned uh, in their so social service. Um, let us do social service for a reader who asks, and I feel like they are asking from a place of um, personal experience when they say, um, how do you push through when the story doesn't feel right? And what do you do when you get tired and you want to start everything over? Um, well, I draw and I write. So there's an advantage to that. So when I can't write well, something's not working well, I can draw and vice versa. If I can't, you know, you know, draw well, <laughs> I could just start taking notes and just study. Like what, most of writing, I think is studying. Honestly, that's, that's the hard, that's like what takes the most time studying, not actually putting the word down on paper in my, in my, my view. Um, and so, um, yeah, I, I try not to get stuck. If I get stuck on something, it probably just means that I, um, I, I just haven't solved the problem. So uh, I, I actually feel like my drawings are like a thermometer that tells me like if the temperature is right. Because if the drawings look clean and I like know exactly how to draw something and things like roll like really, really quickly, just like feels like it's just, you know, just like I'm just expelling art you know uh <laughs> like you're like oh my goodness it's like this is just you know i can't stop um uh, when that's happening that probably means i'm on the right path hmm. but when it feels like like i can't draw like somebody's feet or <laughs> all of a sudden i can't figure out how to draw the characters i've drawn forever i sense that like my spidey sense is telling me you just need to stop and think hmm. about it because you probably don't want to draw what you're about to draw and so and when, you, to, and when you reach that point that so you you refocus somewhere else. You find something else to chew on. Yeah, and, and sometimes that's like nothing. Not, it has nothing to do with art. It's just to go take care of my kids. It's to hang out with them. You know, go outside, do some gardening, anything, just anything that uh, washing dishes. You know, that works out really well. Anything that just needs to get done around the house, uh, it gives me a chance to to daydream. And usually, it's in the daydreaming. It's like when you're taking a shower or on a bike or you're taking you're shopping for groceries. That's when your brain, there's a part of your brain that's still working on your story. It'll find that, it might find that solution from something that you never expected. 
and then you're, you'll be like, that's it. And then when you go back, that's those are the days when I go back, I go, I got it. I got this. I, I figured it out. And then you sit down and you start working, then it'll show up. And, and then that's what I try to capture and put into the books. And I try to make all 200 pages of an amulet book um, full of that type of content so that if I do that, in the minds of the reader, that book is worth more than the 200 pages. Every page is worth more than a page of just regular, just drawings. It's, it means more, you know, it's like, it's got, it's packed with thought and value <laughs> that if, that they unpack, you know, uh, and in their mind and the move and the, the book becomes, uh, you know, it's like, it's, 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 it's got a tremendous amount of value for the amount of space that it takes up on your bookshelf. Uh, it's something I call a pocket epic. That's what I try to do. Like, one of the one of the things that I hear other comic artists uh, sort of lament about is I spend two years writing this graphic novel and a reader can chew through it in an hour and a half. Do you have um, uh, do you have like consolation? Do you have any words of reassurance for these artists who are worried about this issue? Wait, wait, say again. So what what are they worried about? You know, you know that idea where a graphic novel takes so long to make, but it can mm. be consumed so quickly. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. No, that's a, that's a good one. I was worried about that too. Um, but I started thinking about uh, how I process information myself, and think about like the books that I've read and stuff like that. And I actually valued the memory that I had more of a book more than the book itself. Because if I can't remember it, then it's gone. <laughs> so it's not with yeah. me anymore. And sometimes something very, very long and ornate isn't necessarily memorable. Sometimes they are. Sometimes it's full of so much content. You're like, that is like, every this book has everything. And uh, like anything Steinbeck, no matter how long it is, it just feels like it's, it's it, there's nothing that's out of place. Uh, and so, um, you know, those do stay with you. Um, but like the ones that really, really stay with me are the short books that I can read in an afternoon uh, very quickly. Um, you know, like Cannery Row, my favorite book, Old Man in the Sea, The Time Machine, these books I can read in one sitting and I go back and reread them all the time. So I ended up spending more time with those books by rereading them and remembering them than I would reading a tome <laughs> um, uh, like, you know, that has like a ton of dense, like ton of information that maybe I don't really need. Uh, and so, I, you know, and there's only so much space in our brains. So you want to make sure there's a bookshelf in your brain, you know? <laughs> and so I, I, I know that there's only a limited amount of space that I can put my books in, slot them into. And I don't want to fill that shelf with content that these people don't need. So I try to whittle it down and comics, you know, saving you that time and making the, you know, getting all that information in such a short amount of time, that should be looked at as a strength, especially in this time when there's so much information to curate. There's too much information for kids and, and readers these days to choose from. There's just so much content. So which content are they going to choose to keep with them? Which ones are they going to take with them to school? Or or if they're an astronaut, which ones are they going to take? You know, which ones are they going uh, to take uh, to, with them to the moon? You know, like, cause there's not much space on that space station. So I think about that. I, I thought about that when I made Amulet 8. I thought some of these kids, one of these kids is going to be like on a moon base. <laughs> and they're going to read this book. And what do I want to tell that moon base kid, you know, uh, in the book? And I got to make sure that the form factor of the book is tight enough that it could fit within the, the you know, like the, the restrictions of the amount of stuff that they can take. And if it's if it's really dense and like if it's like this information that is like very small, they can take multiple books. You know, they won't have to choose my book over another one. Like, um, you know, they, they may have to choose between, you know, the seventh book of Harry Potter over uh, any of the other ones. And they'll probably end up choosing maybe the first or the third, I think. They probably might choose third. the fourth. Yeah. So the third would be my choice. You know, <laughs> and, and partly because, and not not because, because I think the fourth one is actually probably the strongest book that she wrote in that series. But the third book has the strongest moment, and it also has a form mm. factor that allows me to take one more book with me. So if I had to choose <laughs> through my inventory, 
like it might it might end up taking taking that space. So I actually thought about that <laughs> when I was making Amulet Eight, and I was like, okay, I got to make sure it's you know it's easy to it's see, it's easy to look at. You could see it on the shelf. It's very easy to find. It's also got a good form factor. Fits in a backpack, uh, and it has and it has all the nutriment that you would want in a <laughs> literary work that uh, for somebody who is sitting there being a gardener on the on mars or the moon <laughs> right so, so like so the yeah. you don't have the, to think about by the way if anybody's watching this and they're like making comics and stuff you don't have to think about that stuff that's that's <laughs> i'm just interested in it so if i find it fascinating that that could happen um, but when when a a an artist is chewing away at a page and maybe maybe they're spending an entire day or two drawing one page knowing uh -huh. oh someone's just going to read this in five minutes they can take solace in the fact that the impression a book leaves on the reader is mm -hmm. not related to the amount of time it takes to read or the right. space it takes up on the shelf yeah um, but it is it is real it, it does relate to the amount of thinking that the author has done to put it there right so quality poetry the poetry is fantastic you know you get really good stuff in these, these bite-sized chunks you know and 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 so it's super you know it's a super uh, efficient way to get information across and comics are like poetry uh like a big big poem and and so you know i i, I think that they have they have a tremendous amount of strength because they also have pictures to use is to 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 elevate the amount of information you're, you're getting yeah. across um, Tilly Walden has many very long, very large books, but my favorite of hers is, I think, one that's 30 pages long. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, yeah. Consolation. So, yeah, <laughs> so, yeah it's, it's totally fine. Yeah, it's totally fine. Try to actually make them shorter. If you can make make books that are not super long. That's I, I honestly believe that, that like 200 pages is pretty good. You yeah. can get a lot done. You can get a lot done in there. Uh, I think we have addressed at least most of yes. the questions we've yeah. Everyone has left this. Everyone has <laughs> left. It's just me and you right now, Tony. That, no one has lasted this long. If you've lasted this long, you know, congratulations. Bless you. Yes. You, you get the chocolate factory. <laughs> yes. Um, but yeah, like I mentioned at the, uh, is there anything you would like to to send away with the viewers now that they've reached the uh, four hour mark? Uh, now that they know everything. <laughs> Certainly, uh, certainly. I want to. I want to reiterate, and I want to re, uh, redirect people over to uh, boltcity.com, boltcityproductions.com. Both of those, I think, go to the same place. Yes, same right? place. Yeah. Yep. Um, where again, you yeah, you're doing a great. You're showing a lot of really early work. The when yeah, amulet. Yeah, if you want to see the making of amulet? I put some of that stuff on there. I'll probably oh end up expanding. I'll probably end up expanding that into a book at some point. Um, and you, you know, have so, you have copper stuff on there as well, right? Yeah, you can read web comics on there. I put totally all of Daisy, copper. I put all of Daisy Cutter, uh, the last train on there, which Tony, Tony, Tony actually, <laughs> a few t t Tony. Uh, oh, here you go, t Tony. Tony, help me, <laughs> help me uh, uh, on some of that. On some of that. So the entire thing um, is up there for people to read. Yeah, yeah. I I just put it up there. Right. Yeah, it's because it, it's it's out of print. I I just figure you know I'd rather people read it than not. And if I went back to Daisy Cutter, I would actually redraw that whole first book before <laughs> I work on the second. There's a it's a trilogy, and I want to complete it someday. Uh, but I I think I, I would redraw the first and then uh, draw the second and third. So you, in the free con it's con free content, but it's not like a book I would republish anyway. <laughs> Wait, what? okay, I have to stop you there. Why would you redraw it? Because I draw differently now. So, is, but is it a question would be of aesthetics? Color. Is it a question of aesthetics or is it a question yes. of you would rat? Okay, so it's not it's, like- It's mainly you for- You wouldn't change the storytelling. You wouldn't no, 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 no. I, I, would, I would do as much to retain what's there. I'm just gonna, I would basically do what Yasujiro Ozu did with his films. And he kept remaking the same movies over and over again, <laughs> and just kept better, getting better and better. Uh, but Daisy's also a, a comic that was originally formatted for the nine by uh, or the uh, ten by. What is the the comic? Yeah, the comic book format. So it wasn't made to be read at six by nine. Hmm. So it's a bit like reading uh, Tintin at six by nine. <laughs> 
it's hard. Like I see my son reading and he's just like, <laughs> he can barely see the word. So like I, I had to make sure to get the bigger ones because they were originally printed really large, um, like on a news, like kind of a news format, you know, or like a, the bidets, right? The, the, the French yeah. or the European comics format, which is much bigger um, and, and shrinking it all the way down. It's, it's really hard to read. And I think Daisy Cutter has a little bit of that. So I would like to reformat it for um for the new format which is six six inches by nine inches um for for the uninitiated listener uh because who said uh bidet not bidet mm -hmm. uh which is not bidet is. uh bidets bidet, are great too bid <laughs> again that, that's a that's the topic for our third string um speed racer number two mm -hmm. bidets number three <laughs> okay. um but uh, uh, for those who don't know, Bande Dessinée is uh, Franco-Belgian comics. It's it's the term for for what we see in Tintin, as well as or Tintin, as well as a lot yeah. of other comics from that culture. Um, All right. So I think we should uh, one, let these people one final go. Question: When you when you're doing <laughs> when you're doing um, sound effects in your book, do you let do you quietly as you're drawing? Do you kind of make the sounds in in Aaron, since we're not going to do this oh wait do you want did you we didn't we never got to some next time we'll we'll do the we'll do the we camera do. we'll do the camera view but we talk too much so um <laughs> do i do sound effects yeah i actually do uh sometimes you know like I, I try to i try to think about what it would sound like and and, and play act you know i still do i still do that so um but not not when anybody else is around <laughs> fair enough well okay Thanks. Thank you very much for sharing so much of your time with us. Thank you for affecting comics in such a positive way. Oh, well, I always, you, I always feel more inspired to go out and make comics after we talk. So. Oh, okay. Well, you know, and also people should check out your books because your, your books are, are phenomenal and some of the most beautifully packaged works on the shelf right now. And That's Delilah Very Dirk, kind of you to say. That is very you know, kind of you to say. Big fan. So, <laughs> big fan of Tony's work. And you have uh, children's books coming out now too. I do, but this is not about me. Yes, I have a children's yeah, well, book called Let's Get Sleepy coming out in August. There you go. Um, it's very All exciting. Right. That's awesome. Um, but yeah, you know, uh, there we are, comic books. <laughs> and now, since there's no, there are no stage lights, there are no audiences getting up and leaving to do other things. It everything. They've already we left. Agree. Yeah, we are. <laughs> <laughs> they went to the next. They went to the next podcast. Uh, yeah. So now we just sort of sit here and maybe press a button at the end. But yes, again, thank you very much, Kazu. Yeah. Um, have have I have I oh, failed to you, direct Tony. everybody in the right direction for you? Yeah. Well, they should all go check out VanCav because that's what we're doing this for Vancouver Comic Arts uh, Festival. Uh, I go pretty much every year. Uh, I love going up to Vancouver. It's actually a short drive from where I live uh, near Seattle, uh, and uh, it's it's one of the best shows. I think uh, in, in you know in North America, um, really really I, great community. Um, yeah, I, I love VanCaf. I love TCAF. TCAF is one yep. of my favorite shows. Um, if just, any if anybody's watching this who has never attended a VanCaf or or a TCAF um, in person, they're free events. You can go in. There's no risk to you basically, except that you might end up spending too much money on books. Yeah, and it's generally a family friendly affair as well. Absolutely. Uh, so you can bring family. Uh, it's a uh, it's it's a really nice like really nice my marketplace of, uh, of, of like comics that feel like homemade crafts and things like that. And it's fantastic. I, I love, always love seeing what, uh, what people are up to just because they want to make it. And yeah. um, it's, it's one of those places. So um, I, I highly recommend checking out Bandcalf and TCAF. Yeah. And um, if you, yeah. um, I mean, if you are an aspiring comics artist or writer and, and just nothing is going to keep you from making comics, there are also fantastic venues to go up, meet your favorite author, ask some questions that you, we didn't get a chance to cover today. Um, yeah, yeah that's, how, that's, how, that's how we met. Yep. Yeah, it's, it's extremely accessible. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, can't say enough good things. Uh, but yeah, thank you All again, right. Kazu. This has been well, great. Thank Thank you, Tony. <laughs> so I'm gonna okay. This is this is the end of the broadcast. Thanks for staying if you stayed with us. All right. <laughs> Bye, guys. <laughs>